Hello and welcome back to another week of the Charm Offensive, uh, or should I say a Charmed Christmas? Uh, sadly, this will be our last week of the Charm Offensive, but <laughs> I will power through it. I mean, really all my emotion went into like last, like this, this chapter was really fun and really amazing, but like my, my sadness of ending everything uh, did like, and, and the book ending and finishing off that has been, like, last week did feel like the end. This is, like, our fun follow-up. Also, it's funny that all the, um, like, follow-up chapters, I feel like are uh, holiday-themed. I guess uh, we've only had two, <laughs> and we've only read three books, but, like, Red, White, and Royal Blue is... Was that Thanksgiving? Oh my god, I can't remember. It was kind of... No, it was kind of... No, it wasn't that holiday-themed. It, it skipped over a bunch of times. Okay. Don't worry, my theory has been crushed. Um, but I am, like, this This is my reacts to Christmas movies uh, shirt, but I felt like it had to be done, it had to be worn, um, it had to be, and this is the first time, B bear with me, I don't stand up usually, we did an episode of the podcast where I stood up the other day, wild time, um, but this is the first time that... Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. Um, this is the first time that me actually been in pajama pants works. I'm in pajama pants all the time. I'm either in shorts from the gym, um, pajama shorts or pajama pants. And this is the first time I can like confidently get up because it's like Christmas morning vibes. You know, you're wearing it, you're in your pants. Like you cook, like it's, it works. And I'm so happy about it. Like. <laughs> For once, I don't have to... Like, sometimes I'll be sitting here in a reaction. This has just become, like, a start of a podcast episode. And I'll, like... Because I get really, like... I, I lo love doing this. But I can't sit in one place. Like, as you have really noticed, I fidget a lot. It's just something I do. Brain's always going. Can't stop moving. Um, I'm always, like, adjusting myself. Knocking things off my desk. Uh, like, moving when I'm watching. I can't, like... I don't know, some reactors, like I watch a lot of reactors and from what you see, they just sit there and do their thing and I'm like, wow, isn't that amazing? Because I go to edit mine, I'm touching my face, I'm moving constantly in my seat. I'm aware of it, it's just, I can't not like do that. Sometimes I will even hear, like I have a couple of fidget toys on my desk. When I'm editing, I'll hear my, like this faintest sound that I feel like someone might not pick up because I know what it is and what I'm doing. Um, or like I'll like be talking and I'll be looking down and it's definitely me looking at what <laughs> I'm doing because I get distracted really easily. Um, speaking of distracted easily, where was I going with this? Oh yeah, like cause I move so much. Sometimes I do like a, like I'll move and my leg will like pop into frame and I'll be like, shit, like what am I wearing? What ugly? Cause I like, I don't have to dress like I, especially if I'm in like some sort of like, you know, shirt, nice jacket, like I'm trying to look dressy and then I like throw a leg up and I'm just nodding. It's like sometimes I'll be like, if we do something for like a suit or like a suit and a blazer and something, I'll have that on and just shorts. Like I have a pair of shorts, they're not in here, so I can't show you, but they're just a pair of shorts that I wear to bed. They're, they're pajama shorts with hot dogs all over them <laughs> because, and I'll be like dressed up all fancy in the top and then I'll just be in these pajama shorts. But today, legs, legs can go up. That isn't that fun. Um, yeah, that's, sorry, that's my side tangent. Um, before we get into this chapter and how cute and lovely it is, the only other thing I will say is obviously it's not it's not in the book, doesn't exist in here. So we're reading off my computer, which reading off a computer is just not the same. There's, it's not the same as like a physical thing or even like I would probably say a tablet, just not having that like mobility. Cause I don't read in this room. This is not where I sit and read and like relax. Like I go to my lounge room and you know, sit on the couch and read. Like that's, that's where I go to read my book. And I was like sitting here, I was like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not as comfortable as I usually am. Um, but yeah, this chapter was really cute. I'll be reading off this. So I'll, I'm, I'm sorry that I won't be looking at you a lot. Um, because the ca having the camera there, like in front of me where I'm reading is really weird when you're like, A, it would block half of it, but B, it'd kind of be like, I don't know if you can tell I'm doing it now, but it's kind of weird to be reading 
and the camera been in front of you, but you're looking like past where you are. I don't know, that to me is unsettling. So we are going to, I'm just gonna stare there like I do in a reaction and we'll figure out. And then I'll come back and we'll talk about things. But for now, charmed offensive, a charmed Christmas. Also like and subscribe. So we open up and I actually thought that it was going to be more of a, um, a recap chapter for some reason. Like we started with like recapping what was going on, what was happening. I was like, oh, what do we- I thought we we're doing? And then like it moved straight on to Christmas and then it moved straight. It went from, I thought it was going to be a recap episode to holy shit. Charlie's thinking about proposing and I was like what the actual fu-? like that is so exciting and it hasn't been a big time skip too which is like even more you're like oh we're like we're going there which is really cute and fun um but we're we're preparing for our little like Christmas get together with all the gang um and Parisia, Jules and Charlie are in the kitchen and Charlie's talking about proposing. I love how open he is. And stuff. It's so cute. It's so cute. Um, but they're kind of like, um, maybe don't. And he's like, but what? He's like, because isn't that what you do? Isn't he supposed to propose? When you love someone so much, it feels like you've grown a second heart for them. When your heart beats frantically every time they're near. The next step is marriage. That's how the story is supposed to go. Right? My dar- like, he is- he is a darling. He is a cutie. He is a sweetie. I love how much he is, like, ready to go that step. Like, he's like, no, I kind of found my person and I don't want to figure out anyone else. <laughs> I, I'm- I'm done. I'm in love. I'm happy and I'm ready for forever with them. He's like, I'm, I don't know what y'all are thinking, but I'm, I'm done. I'm like, I'm, I have my life sorted now. This is my person. I think it's so cute. Um, and then he also starts talking about like his new, like, you know, what he's done for Christmas. Um, cause, cause they keep talking out of it. So it, it kind of like moves slowly through, uh, Charlie figuring out like, you know, he's like, oh, should I, shouldn't I? But this is, this is what we have. This is what we're doing. This is how I am. Um, but I thought this was really cute. This Christmas, though, he has Dev and he has his house and his friends to fill it with. So he wants wholesome, damn it. Judy Garland is singing from an antique record player. And there is a fake Christmas tree with white branches covered in rainbow colored ornaments. Dev's contribution. And the 60 inch, inch flat screen is now crackling fireplace with a single Yule log. He went so as far as to bake cut out cookies from scratch and decorate them with homemade vegan frosting. They're artistically displayed on a snowman platter next to a glass bowl of candy cane Hershey kisses. It's wholesome as shit. Oh, like they're just, the, he's like, you know, I'm putting on a Christmas show. I'm putting on a Christmas spectacular with the house that I live in with the man that I love. I think I'm ready for marriage. <laughs> he's like, I've got this shit under control, I know what's going on, um, and, like, I want to propose, and they're like, dude, we get it, they're like, dude, we get it, you, also, I thought Jules and Parisia were dating for some reason, obviously, as we move through this, we realise that they're not, but I thought that was gonna happen, I don't know if I'm crazy, but, like, I was like, oh, yeah, they're going to date, and then, th they didn't, because they, like, set it up, they, like, started in this chapter, they're like, we're here, we're, they're together, like, not together, but, like, they're here together on the bench, and I thought they were before, like, the rest of the party was here, and I was like, oh, they're dating, and then they're just not, I don't know, maybe I read that really wrong, um, but they keep saying, like, oh, like, bro, it's been, like, was it six weeks or six months? It's been only, like, so, it hasn't been a long time for a proposal, which I guess, like, I agree to an extent, I do think I am one of those, well, you know, I've never been in love, so I couldn't exactly answer that, um, but yeah, I feel like you have to have, in my opinion, it's like, yeah, a couple of years makes more sense in my mind now, currently, as the human I am, I'm like, you need a couple of years before proposal, but 
I do believe you could probably propose on the first date and some people would just, it would work. It would work for them. Um, but when then we get this fun interjection that I was not expecting. I was not expecting this person to be here. I was really happy with it, actually. Um, uh, but is it, uh, they, they're having a, sorry, I was like, where am I? <laughs> they're having some sort of argument um, and uh, Parisia, uh, Jules snaps, you just want to cram your opinions down my throat. But isn't that what you're doing to Charlie? Says a quiet voice from the other side of the kitchen. Unlike Parisia and Jules, who haven't even bothered with the pretense of offering to help with dinner, Daphne Reynolds, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, the fourth kitchen occupant, is pulling the vegan roast out of the oven, looking every bit like a Better Homes and Gardens centerfold article about holiday hosting. She's wearing a red Christmas sweater, uh, peppered with white snowflakes, and her blonde hair is in its signature loose curls, her blue eyes bright and warm. I'm so happy Daphne's here. I wasn't expecting any of the ladies to actually really, like, come on, like, progress with us. You know what I mean? And I love that they had, they did have a lot of good moments together, and I really reckon that is how their friendship has 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 bonded like her and Charlie. I think that's really nice. Um, but uh, they start talking about you know they they call her princess because she's on the next season, um, and you know why is going into marriage so quickly a bad thing? And don't y'all work on a show where people are expected to get engaged that quickly? Yes, but we don't believe it actually works. Jules shrieks. Well, Daphne removes her oven mitt and sets it on the counter with a thwack. That's very comforting to hear. Jules scoffs at her. Everyone who goes on Ever After has a secret agenda. I don't, Daphne says, and Charlie believes her. Charlie didn't expect to fall in love with any contestants from this, his season, but he fell in love with Daphne. In easy, platonic love. The love of feeling like someone understands you, instantly, with little expectation. The kind of friend he can sit in total silence with. He could never have made it through the last few months without her. Um, and despite the fear of Parisia, she's defending him in front of his bulldozer of a best friend. Ugh, I, I really like this, like, Daphne, um, Charlie dynamic. I think it's amazing that they do talk about platonic love. I don't know. I think platonic love is very underrated and it's always there but it's not specifically ever really stated or talked about you know you have the friends in media you know I love you man but it's not really ever I don't know no one really talk ever like says that that platonic platonic love and it's like true and just as real it's different but it's the same sort of thing it's still like a birdie like you know that love is so strong and Oh, I love it. I don't know. I, you know, I'm a sucker for a bit of pl platonic love. Call me sappy, but maybe I do love my friends. Actually, <laughs> I was saying this the other, the other day because I'm like talking about loving my friends. Ugh. Um, I'm always, I love to bully my friends. Like I love to be mean to my friends and you know, that's, that's my shtick. That's what I bring to the group. Um, and I was saying to, uh, we we're talking about something and I was like, yeah, I was talking about you the other day. And, I, you know, I was saying how much I like you or something. And they're like, what do you mean? They're like, you're talking nice behind our backs. And I was like, yeah, I always do. And they're like, but you're so meek to us in person. I'm like, yeah, that's how I work. That's literally what I was doing here. I was like, I love my friends. I own the other. <laughs> Maybe I need to tell them I like them more. Um, I'm the opposite of the bad friend. I don't talk shit. I talk shit to your face. And then I talk love behind your back. Oh my god. I think it's so funny. I love how my roles, <laughs> those typical ones are reversed. I'm like, yeah, I'll never be, I'll never say anything nice to my face. Behind their, behind their backs, in private, when they can't hear what I'm talking about, I say how much they are great. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I don't know where I was going with that. Just platonic love's great. Love my friends. Would never t t tell them. I do tell them that occasionally, you know. Especially if I have a drink or two, I get really lovey. But, you know, gotta, you know, you gotta peep, <laughs> you gotta leave them wanting more. Um, but yeah, Platonic Love's great. Daphne really shines in this chapter. And I feel like we could have done like a follow up book where it's about Daphne, but also includes it. I don't know. But 
we we move on or else i'm going to keep talking in circles okay so um they go into more in depth about why they don't think that charlie should wait it's hard and i get it because I guess your best friends are, your best friends are going to have a range of opinions and it's good to have people that don't always just completely back you in a way because they're not doing this don't propose to him out of like, we don't like him, you know, hatred, like any mean jealousy. It's very much like you guys haven't been together for that long, you know, you don't know like all this stuff. Like there's a lot to it that they're actually like thinking about and hoping that he will take into consideration because obviously they still do want what's best for both of them, been best friends of to the both of the partners. Um, but they're also talking about how Charlie is still figuring himself out, exploring, like, what he wants. Like, does he, you know, would he want to be with Dev? He hasn't had anyone. It's very, like, complicated. And they're trying to be like, you know, we want to make sure you've thought of everything. I am exploring my identity with Dev. Parisia sighs and Jules tags in. Okay, but Dev is never going to want to open your relationship. I've heard him say so multiple times. He's right or die monogamous. So, are you sure you'll be content only having sex with the one person um, ever in your whole life? Only being with Dev forever. Dev forever. Having Dev's long fingers on his body, Dev's bony hips beneath his, Dev's mouth and his smoky sweet smell. Having Dev under him and over him. First thing in the morning, when he's still got crusted sleep in the corners of his eyes. Dev before bed, minty and moisturised. Soft, sleepy touches. Dev in the hallway, right when he gets home from work, and drops his backpack at the front door, because he simply can't wait another minute. Dev in their bed, Dev in the shower, Dev on the couch. Dev in the backyard hammock, that one Sunday afternoon, when the wind was hot and it kept blowing Dev's hair into his glasses. Both of them laughing too hard and sweating too much to do anything but lie there, half naked in the sun. Yes, Charlie says, with a level of conviction that causes both Jules and Parisia to flinch in their stools. Out of the corner of his eyes, he sees Daphne smile. I'm sure. Weird, is Jules' thoughtful response once she's recovered from her shock. Um, A, I felt like we were doing a Dr. Seuss novel. (laughs) Like, Dev on the, Dev on the, Dev on the... I can't rhyme quick enough. Um, Dev on the box. Dev in socks. Dev's a jock. Dev dressed up like Goldilocks. Like, you, you, I, couldn't, I couldn't think of any Dr. Seuss quick enough. But I was like, whoa. When he, when he said, Dev on the bed, Dev in the shower, Dev on the couch. I was like, whoa, we're, we're entering some weird crossover realm. Um, but jokes aside, that is beautiful. Like, he's like, it's only Dev. Dev is only what I want. Like, Dev is everything to me. I love that, you know, it's our house, our things, our life together. I just... And for him to... I love how much he notices all these things. I think it's so beautiful. Um, but we get into this next bit uh, where Parisia is like, I'm going to double down. As they traipse outside through the French doors, Parisia comes around the corner. She's the same height as Charlie. So when she stands in front of him, her eyes bore directly into his. Thank you for telling us more about how this works, she says softly, pressing her hand to his chest, to the place where the two hearts, his and Dev, would be through the layers of his cashmere sweater. But when she moves her hand up to his face and taps two fingers against his crinkled forehead. But I also know how this works. I know that you tend to hyperfixate on things and get tunnel vision sometimes. When you do develop an obsession, it sometimes overrides your logical side. Remember when we first started working together and you were seven seasons deep into that Doctor Who rewatch and you brought us a last minute plane ticket to Cardiff so we could go to that Doctor Who museum or whatever? He grimaces. That was not time nor money well spent. Exactly. She comes closer and wraps her soft arms around him until he's pressed against the plushness of her body. I'm worried that right now you're in a dev wormhole and that you're about to make an impulsive decision that will have consequences beyond wasting a bunch of money. I think, while that sounds really kind of fucking rude, you know what I mean? Is she's doing it for the absolute best reasons. Um, 
because she does know how he works and how he exists and how things like this have happened before and you know yada 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 etc so on and so forth um but i think <clears throat> and you can obviously have obsession with people and stuff but i feel like when you have this this um like human and love connection involved i think an obsession is very different because you can obviously be obsessed with people and, and love people to the point of obsession. Um, but I do weirdly think that it can be different in very many ways. Like a lot of that comes out when you see like movies and TV shows. I'm just likening it to that. So it's not real, but you know, um, <clears throat> cause it happens in real life to like stalkers and those, like those unhealthy obsessions. But I think you can have healthy obsessions with people too. And even those things, they may not la like they may last forever. Like he could be obsessed with Dev until he dies. Like I think there's, you know, you never know how long a, an obsession could last for. And I think when it is healthy, like he's pushing, you know, he's doing things he doesn't do. He's learning. He's in love. He's happy. He's still really healthy. He's growing. I don't think somewhat of that obsession. And he does realize that he doesn't need dev to grow like he he realized when dev left and he can detach himself from dev and still be his own person i think that sort of a love obsession could not sometimes couldn't be the worst thing to exist in world but again i don't know again i haven't been in love again not in a relationship so coming from and obviously i think at all points in time and existence um you know, you move out of that sort of, from what I've heard, from what I've seen, from movies and TV shows and books, you know, there comes a point where relationships, you know, you go from honeymoon love obsession to kind of boring love and obsession, and not boring, I just can't think of the right word, just like, it's, it's that, but it's not the crazy fires, it's still this really passionate things, but it takes on an everyday sort um, and I think, I don't think Charlie will, will, will switch out of his obsession with Dev. At least I would like to think, um, that he wouldn't, um, in the slightest at any point in time. So they're ready to, um, to, you know, eat, eat dinner, <laughs> go and have it. Um, and then right here on the patio in their backyard, in front of their friends, it's a small kiss, uh, as sweet as Charlie's eyes, but when Charlie touches two fingers to the side of Dev's throat, he can't remember why believing in fairy tales is so wrong. We switch back to Charlie's perspective. Slow, Charlie reminds himself when Dev's lips touch his. Just dating, he chants when Dev's mouth parts for him. Ten feet away is a picnic table filled with all their closest friends, but their existence seems to fade away, somehow, between Dev's stubble and Dev's smile. He somehow, um, he somehow always smiles while they kiss. Charlie has two hearts, and both are beating like hummingbird wings against his ribcage. Some of the sweet ways they, um, they write this is too fucking adorable. And then we go here when we talk about, oh, we get to talk about how they went for a small trip to see Dev's parents. And I thought it was absolutely so amazing. I was in love with it. Like, they're kind of living the dream and I hate them for it. Dev's parents immediately welcomed him like family, even though they'd never met. They hugged him repeatedly, but only after asking permission, and spent the whole weekend trying to stuff him with food. His mum did yoga with Charlie every morning, and his dad went for runs with him every night. And once, while Dev was on a stealth mission to Sean's shack so he could shotgun a burger out of sight of his vegetarian parents, Dev's mum stroked Charlie's cheek and whispered, You're exactly who I dreamed up for him. And Dev... Dev and Rayleigh, restlessly swinging on the front porch swing, swaying on the front porch swing, Dev making them all say that they're thankful for the meal of takeout Chinese food, Dev making mocktails and forcing them to watch Love Actually to mark the beginning of the Christmas season, Dev kissing him good morning in the kitchen while his dad sat right there at the breakfast nook doing his crossword puzzle. There were no cameras, no producers, this was just life, the way Charlie never dared to imagine it could be. It was so easy to see the future spool out before him, a forever with Dev. On their last day in Rayleigh, 
Charlie went Christmas shopping with Dev's mum to help pick out some non-cargo shorts as a present. Dev was in desperate need of professional clothes for his networking meetings as a screenwriter and he wouldn't be able to borrow from ever after wardrobe department forever. In a tiny boutique downtown, Charlie saw it. It was a thin, white gold wedding band with art deco flowers engraved alongside small inlaid diamonds. It looked like a ring for a fairy tale prince. It looked like Dev. Without a second thought, he bought at the ring, and although Dev's mum pretended not to notice, she winked at him in the department drop-off the next day, like she knew. I love how they've just, like, um, accepted, like, Dev's parents get the the real A+. They've just, like, accepted him, ready to love him, like, you know, even did the thing of wanting to give him a hug and, you know, t- you know, familial, like, nice touch him, but, like, made sure it was okay uh, they, they like spend time with him i don't know it's really sweet it's a, that those whole like family especially knowing charlie doesn't have that sort of family experience like they will become his mum and dad like they will be his mum and dad but also like his mum and dad you know what i mean like he'll probably you know have to go go to them for like opinions and and, and want to talk to them when he's down or talk to them about child, or even when he's got things that he doesn't want to talk to dev about or just wants a different like thing he can go to them and see them i think it's really sweet and really beautiful when he has like these parents that all love him <sighs> I don't know. That's that was honestly, I think, the best moment of this chapter for me. I I just I liked it so much. Um, and then we we jump back to the the Christmas party, and Ryan was talking about how Dev is like a hopeless romantic, and he wants everything to, you know. They were talking about how there was no snow on Christmas, and how Dev's sad about that, and Ryan was kind of like. Of course you're sad about that. Like everything has to be fairy tale, picture perfect for you. And Dev kind of goes inside and's like, "Fuck, I'm kind of sad about that." Um, and Charlie follows him in, and he's like, "Stop! Like, tell me what's wrong." You know, we're at this point where we're not doing this bullshit. You're telling me everything, and they start talking about it. Um, Dev twists in Charlie's arms, so they are now chest to chest. Dev's back against the sink. What do you mean? That's who I am. Charlie holds Dev by the sharp points of his hip bones. You're someone who always sees the good in the world, someone who fights to make even the smallest moments beautiful, someone who believes everything should be magical. How could those possibly be bad traits? I agree. I agree, and I love it. I think it's just so cute. And they need to, get, like, obviously, if you've read it, you know what's happened. If not, spoiler, but I'm guessing you've read this before you come, but, like... They need to get married now. I wish we got the a wedding chapter. I think that would have been really sweet. Um, but everyone starts um, leaving and Daphne is the last one to leave. And they said it as like, it was interesting because Ryan overstayed his welcome by an hour. But even though Daphne's after him, they didn't say she'd overstayed her welcome. Obviously, they probably like Daphne a bit better than Ryan. But it's also, I think, interesting that I think she stayed the latest on purpose to have this conversation uh, with Charlie. I was just thinking about what Prisia and Jules said in the kitchen earlier. She drops her arms so they dangle awkwardly. It's just, for most of my life, I've tried to conform to other people's timelines for me. Freshman year of high school, I got a boyfriend, because everyone said that's what you're supposed to do when you start dating. Never mind that I had a giant crush on my female best friend. Daphne flashes her tiny, self-deprecating smile, and Charlie's heart twinges as he thinks about all the lies Daphne told herself too. I did beauty pageants because my mother said it would turn me into a proper lady, and then in college, I joined a sorority because my mother said that's how I'd find a good husband. And when I was still single at 25, I went on ever after because I thought that was what I had to do to meet someone's expectations for my life. But all all any of that did was make me miserable. Sweet, awkward Daphne Reynolds reaches out and gently touches his arm, waiting for his permission to leave it there. People are always going to have ideas about how your life is supposed to go, but as long as you listen to them, it's going to be really difficult to figure out where you want to go with your life. She squeezes his arm. This is maybe the most he's ever heard Daphne say at once, and he doesn't want to spook her. He doesn't want her to retreat back behind her own glass wall. He stands there quietly and lets her finish sorting out her thoughts. 
I guess what I'm trying to say is, fuck everyone else's timelines. Charlie snorts. This is definitely the first time he's heard her say fuck. The only people inside your relationship are you and Deb, and if you want to propose to him, do it. You know your own mind. Charlie, listen to you. I think, yep, yeah, that shut Parisia up, that shut, shut Jules up, that shut Charlie's mind up, that shut me up. I agree. It's kind of like, I mean, that's probably one of my biggest thought processes in, in life is if it doesn't concern or bother you that much, who fucking cares? Like, obviously, as their friends, we want to be like, you know, uh, you know, make sure of this, do this, like, you know, don't jump, you know, you want to prepare them for the risks. And I think it's good they did that. Um, but, and I know they'll be happy, like, when they hear the news and everything goes on. Um, and the way you think about it is, it's good, but it is their timeline, their life. And if he wants to do it, you can warn them and talk them through that. But up until that point, if they're still going to do it, that's the decision you have to like work through it. And I think that's really cute that she's like, I think that's a good message. Fuck everyone else's timelines. Do what is good and important for you. So we're kind of getting to the end of it. I skip over a bit, but, um, Basically, they open some presents before they go to bed. They go to bed. Charlie wakes them up early in the morning. Dev's like, what the fuck? Um, Charlie's like, I haven't slept. We're going on a road trip. We're like, what the fuck? He drives up an hour out of um, wherever they live. I forgot. LA. I don't know. Um, into the mountains. And then he starts seeing snow. And I knew as soon as he woke him up, I was like, they're going to see snow. Because they made that point of Dev has never had a white Christmas. And I was so excited for it. Um... But, you know, we're driving up to the snow and Dev, we're in Dev's perspectives. He's like, what's going on? Is this safe or what's happening? And then he's kind of like, snow, like you you brought me here to see snow and you, you gave me my first white Christmas and it's so sweet. And then you're like, oh my God, Charlie is definitely going to, well, you're like Charlie's going to propose. But Dev kind of hasn't clocked onto that. Charlie gestures the snow awkwardly. I wanted to show you that there's nothing wrong with wanting a world to be romantic and magical. He steadies himself in the snow, standing straighter. You make my world romantic and magical every day, Dev. And it's suddenly clear. Fuck his fear of judgement. Fuck Ryan wanting to use them for ratings. For making Dev feels like his dreams weren't cheap. He loves Charlie more than he ever thought was possible. More to the point, he loves Nora Ephron. He can't wait another minute, another fucking second. He plunges his hands into his pockets of the coat, searching for something anything. He pulls out a stale red vine he left there from God knows when. It'll have to work. Dev drops down to one knee on the snow. I love the thought of like a fake, like a non-ring ring. I think that is a really cute thing that works really well. Um, a favorite Taylor Swift song of mine. Sorry to bring, um, bring one of my loves into this conversation, but she has a song called A Paper Rings, which I think is so cute. Um, you know, it's about, um, she's like, I'll, you know, I'll marry you with paper rings. Like it's, she's like, you know, anything can kind of like symbolize that love. I don't need anything or we don't need anything. We just need like us and not all these things work. Um, I just think it's the cutest thing ever. I love that song. I think it works so well. It also makes me, I don't know if anyone, <laughs> if this is anyone else's like, you a youtuber that you used to watch from like this is pro probably when i was i still listen to their podcast now um but grace helbig was a big person i used to watch on youtube when i was younger um and again still watch and listen to their podcast uh but i remember she i'm pretty sure walked like out of the chapel when she got married to paper rings i it just like paper rings sends me on a, a thought process i think it's so cute um we we go back to this so when i met you i fell stupidly in love with you i thought it wouldn't last and i thought people like me didn't get a happily ever after charlie strokes dev's cheek you're so worthy of love love i know i know that now but also his voice cracks I thought I had to overcorrect. I thought being healthy meant putting away my childish ideas of love. I needed to be practical and grounded. But you see, my idealism and my romanticism. And you, you just accept it. 
I love it, he corrects. And the, the world has enough cynicism in it, but you're hopeful and you're earnest and you're passionate and you care so damn much. Dev releases a half that is a half laugh, half indignation. See that? You make it sound like it's okay for, to, to love Nor Aphleron. Is that the You've Got Mail director? If so, I don't see why it could possibly be wrong to love her. Dev's smile threatens to break free of his face. That's the sexiest thing you've ever said to me. Dev lifts the piece of licorice and begins to twist, twist it into a little knot, forcing the candy to stick together until it sort of resembles a... Wait, Charlie interrupts, a reality crashing into him. He finally drops his hand. You can't propose to me right now. Um, which is obviously probably the scariest thing Dev could ever hear. But like, we know what's going on. So uh, Dev does have a little freak out. I can't. Charlie Michael Winshaw, I want to marry the shit out of you. And even if you can't, uh, you're about to say no right now, I have to tell you that. Because the truth is, uh, because it's the truth and because you taught me how to be brave. No, Dev, Charlie laughs. It's a choking, barking thing. He may be, he's maybe crying, he realises. You can't propose to me because I was going to propose to you. He pulls the ring out of his pocket and lets it rest in the cup of his hand. Dev stares at the white gold ring in silence. Charlie is too aware of the sweat, uh, wet sweeping through his pyjamas and his heart rattling in his chest. I brought you here to propose, Charlie manages, because I want to marry the shit out of you too. Dev swallows his Adam's apple. <laughs> Dev swallows. His Adam apple makes a whole ordeal out of it. You, you do? Charlie laughs again. He's definitely crying. Of course I do, you beautiful fool. Charlie slides Dev's glasses off with his hand, um, with his free hands so he can see his eyes. So Dev can't hide behind the glass wall either. I don't know how to be a boyfriend. I know even less about what it would be to be a husband, but you are worth every uncertainty. Is that is that your whole, whole proposal speech? Because you had way more time to prepare than me. I love you, Dev, Charlie says simply. Will you marry me? And of course it's a yes, and then we just have this last little bit um, you know, they talk about their wedding and what, what could happen and the promises they made. And then we just get, can we both agree it's fucking freezing out here and go back to the car? Absolutely. Charlie pulls Dev out of the snow and they sloppily run back to the car, holding hands and slipping in the snow until they reach the RAV4. As soon as he starts the car, it sinks to his phone and begins playing White Christmas again. The Michael Bublé version this time. They smile at each other from across the car, four outstretched hands in front of the racing vents, one white gold engagement ring, one licorice ring. Merry Christmas, Dev, Charlie whispers into the car. Dev hears him, of course. Merry Christmas, Charlie. What a cute, sweet way to end it. Like, it's adorable and it's lovely and it's cute and we had our finish and they're engaged. I'm just kind of like so upset that we don't have any like their wedding story um because i think that would be fun and full like anxiety for both of them and it would you know produce absolute beautifulness but i'm really happy with what we got it was so nice and lovely to see i'm just happy that they're person and they're grown for each other and they're happy together and they're happy enough to get married i don't know i'm very just it was a very fulfilling chapter it was a nice send-off to them finishing because like the the actual book kind of ended really we needed that just a little bit more and I'm happy we got it um it was just good like there's there's nothing much to say it filled my soul it made me feel warm and happy inside I loved it I enjoyed it um it's sad it's over but I'm happy knowing that they can go on and we can imagine the wedding and and them having kids and getting the puppy and all these things I think that's the the real amazing thing about it um but yeah we're done we're done with the charm offensive and it's sad but it's happy and we're excited to go on to a to a new journey um i still i didn't do as much research honestly i'm just so bad i'm i'm sorry uh i don't know when we're gonna pick up the book club i don't know if i'll take a week or two off just to like um switch you know uh before we start another one um make sure i know which one i'm picking i definitely 
keep an eye out on the community tab or the post. I don't know where it goes. <laughs> it's very, YouTube still confuses me, but I'm pretty sure a lot of y'all that are here that are in the book club have seen my community posts and tabs and polls before. Um, I'll definitely update on either if I pick the book House on the Cerulean Sea or if I put up a poll, de depending what I do. Um, just because I've got to look into that book more. I keep saying that's the one because it, it was such a popular vote and choice. Um, but I never looked into it as much because it, it never kept winning the polls or like I know the Charm Offensive was like a big one on um, like behind uh, boyfriend materials. So like that's the one I researched next. So I'll do that um, and I'll look into it. But either way, I'm excited to get into it um, and pick back up the book club. It'll probably just be a week, you know, week or two, uh, jump into it, just get everything. Sometimes that means I can then focus on you know, moving, like getting a lot of stuff recorded for other stuff so then I can get back into to the reading and stuff. Um, but I'm excited nonetheless uh, to get into a new book, to 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 learn, figure out, fall in love with all, all over again and with everyone and we can talk about it together. Um, but for now, um, yeah, it's, it's like sad. I don't, I like procrastinate the ending because I don't want it to finish. But um for the last time in the Charm Offensive Saga, I uh, hope you have enjoyed and are having a good day, and um, I hope to see you in the next one.